Hello everyone. Welcome to your brand new podcast called In Your Shoes. This podcast is for you to learn more about new people and professions from around the world. I would like to take you on a journey to understand the life and times of a new person every 2 weeks and get a chance to get into their shoes to learn what they do, why they do and how they do it. Welcome to the podcast Marine. I really appreciate your time and your willingness to get on this podcast and have this conversation with me. Thanks Vivek. Thanks for having me. So Marine, for our podcast listeners, could you kindly share a little bit about yourself? uh like where you come from and what do you do for a living yeah sure um so i'm irish born in ireland um and i lived there for the first 20 years of my life um i studied a little bit in germany as well i studied uh, business and uh, business in german and then um afterwards i started my career in in um germany but um i've been away for a long time and i nowadays i am a consultant in international development projects particularly on private sector development thank you and uh for someone who does not understand the field about international development how would you describe your profession in this line of work um well so international donor organizations like um that are say funded by by governments and um NGOs or not profit organizations they uh, carry out initiatives to help businesses grow in other countries say tradi- tra- what you might call developing countries and transitional countries so i would help those as a as a freelance consultant I would help those organizations um implement their projects. So for example, um to like if an organization wants to support a grant project for business for startups or for ex- for accelerating funds, um I might look into that and help them to set that up or I another thing if they're saying okay we need to support there's a big problem in the in the in the um corn value chain in uh, this country um you know the farmers don't need, seem to be making a lot of money there's but they don't know exactly what the problems are I can go in there with a team of people and we'll try and figure out what are the areas that need support um how do the operators need support but also um you know what can the government be doing like for example i work a lot in rwanda and there the problem is often that there isn't enough supply so for example if there's not enough uh, the s- seeds are not of good enough quality or they're not consistent then you know um i can help identify that and then um the donor and the government can try and improve um to provide grants and subsidies to to help with improve the quality and the distribution of seeds for example all right and uh marine can you share your life trajectory which led you to choose this field of international development yeah um yeah um yeah i would i wouldn't call it a straight path um so I I always wanted to work in I mean I grew up in the 80s and you know um always heard about famine in Ethiopia and um what do you call live aid and all of that that kind of time and I always wanted to help but coming from Ireland um it's very much you know humanitarian assistance and emergency aid response and that you know as I grew older I realized that really wasn't for me And then I studied business and went into you know working in marketing and business development um you know working for both small and large um private sector companies and then um at some point you know I said oh you know I want to do something different maybe I'll do some humanitarian work for a while and uh and then i took some time i took like a few weeks off and went to visit a friend who was in ecuador 
And I saw what she was doing and she was working um, for the German Development uh, Service to help with build up um, small business in Ecuador. And I thought, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so um, I started applying to do things like that with the same organization and then uh, ended up in Rwanda two years later in 2011. And there then I worked supporting the Rwandan Association of Local Government Authorities um, to help foster what's called local economic development. So that's about bringing different stakeholders together, you know, businesses and the community and the government to say, hey, how can we all work together to try and, uh, you know, create jobs, basically. So um, I worked with them for two years. And then after that, I went into I went to Georgia um, to help uh, set up regional development agencies in two of the um, again, working with local government um, in two of the regions of Georgia. And there. Um, yeah. And after that, then I decided, OK, I want to I saw a gap for uh, freelance consultants consulting and it was something that suited that I felt would suit the lifestyle that I wanted to lead as well so um, in 2015 I went back to Rwanda and set up as a freelance consultant there and uh, I left last year and moved to Berlin but continuing in the same line. Thank you thank you for sharing that so Maureen you talked about being at Rwanda and then Georgia so you essentially have a lot of experience with different cultures. Can you briefly share how was your experience um, moving between these different cultures, especially coming from Ireland and then going to Africa and then um, especially with Rwanda and then moving to Georgia? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it was very interesting. I mean, firstly, I mean, I started coming to Germany in, I think, uh, 1995, so 25 years ago, and uh, that was quite a different culture from Ireland, um, even though they're not so far away. Um, and then um, in 2011, before I went to Rwanda, um, I did this uh, course on intercultural competencies, and it was basically preparing Germans for going to, you know, different parts of the world. And it was a real eye opener because for me, it was like learning about figuring out things at that stage, you know, I'd been going to Germany for, yeah, I don't know, more than 15 years. And I was, um, and I was, I, I realized, oh my goodness, so many things about the German culture <laughs> as well as things about African cultures. But, um, what I discovered there is that in, in those um, courses, I discovered something very important that 95% of the world live uh, in, a, in a collectivist way and in um, a certain type of cultural approach. And to this, you know, um, and 5% live in another way, which is more of this individualist um, approach and then, you know, more distance and a different type of mindset and that um, would, would be you know the Germans the Scandinavians the Dutch um, would belong to this five percent so already that was a starter because I thought oh I'm going from Ireland to an to another country where people think collectively so that you know helped but um, the differences between cultures become became so um, I became so aware of it over these few years because at first I went to Rwanda and people would always say that Africans are very open and outgoing and, you know, in your face. But Rwandans are actually very conservative and very reserved is a better word there. And um, they don't share much what's going on. Um, Nonverbal communication is very important um, part of communication. Written communication is not important at all. And so it's, you know, it took a little bit of um, getting used to. And also, um, you know, Rwandans will not typically display a lot of emotion, particularly in a professional setting. Then I moved to Georgia and the Georgians wear their heart on their sleeves. 
So they're completely, um, you know, you can't go to a meeting without people getting emotional and, you know, um, um, animated and things like this. So, I was, you know, so it was such a cultural contrast. And it's a, it's just a fascination of mine, you know, um, and, you know, everything has its strengths and weaknesses. It's not criticisms, but it was, uh, yes, it was that you have to then adjust to these changes when you go to different countries. But that really helped me then for um, for consulting work, because then, like, you know, I I went and did consulting in countries I'd never even been to. So I went to Myanmar. I'd never even been to that part of the world. So, you know, having seen different, um, been thrown into different settings, then I'm much more open to say, oh, maybe this is not there because there's a, cult- a cultural element involved and knowing always to, um, to ask someone, you know, to, to help you with the, with the, with the cultural na- navigation, you know? That's so fascinating to hear, and I totally agree, especially immersion through travel and being in the culture teaches you a lot. And then you, as as you move between different cultures and you interact with them, you pick up the differences and you see in some ways we are all the same, and but we're also yeah. different. Yeah. And I really appreciate the point that you talked about thinking collectively versus thinking as an individual. Yeah. And I want to emphasize and stay on this part a little bit more, especially sure. trying to figure out how do you see the benefits and the disadvantages of both these approaches uh, in the modern life? I suppose I've never really looked at them. I mean, I, I, you know, I know scientists look at them from benefits and um, you know, limitations point of view, but... I suppose I've never really looked at it so much from that point of view. Of course, like in, in, in today, a collectivist mindset is what we need in this pandemic environment because, you know, but I can also see, and it's interesting living in, I mean, you know, we come from those original backgrounds, but of course cultures have merged. So living in somewhere like Berlin, it's very international. So it's not, it doesn't quite fit into stereotypes, but I would see that I've noticed that some people during the pandemic who've been quite, um, you know, individualistic, they actually have also behaved in a manner that helps society because they then put the cotton wool around themselves to make sure that they wouldn't get the virus. Whereas um, people who uh, thought collectively um, behaved in a way where they were trying thinking about reducing the risk for society but in the end the same result comes out you know it's just a different way of looking at it so and i think that was a, that was actually quite a learning for me during during recent months because i thought oh god we're in a society that's typically individualistic how will this go down you know and so, but then i realized ah yeah well it's also quite a risk of our society so um you know, that then it, it, it just balances out, you know? Right. Thank you uh, for, for sharing that. So Maureen, you mentioned that you are also a freelancer uh, working in international development. Uh, yep. Can you share why did you choose to be a freelancer and what benefits does that offer for you in this work? Yeah, well, um, so when I was in... When I started the work in Rwanda, I really loved, um, I liked what I was doing. There were some things I liked and some things I didn't like. Um, I didn't earn a lot of money and that I, that was a good learning because I realized, okay, um, I know that I don't want to earn this much money. Um, I'd like to earn a bit more. I'd like to, more luxury. And then I, the job I had in Georgia, I was paid a lot of money and, um, that helped me, you know, then, it, that, that's really good for having you realize, you know, what it is you actually want. But um, one of the things that I realized, especially in Georgia, was um, I wanted to spend time, like if I was going to be living internationally, I wanted to be able to spend time in Ireland. And freelancing would, would allow me to do that. 
because you know I I can do my work wherever I, not always I mean sometimes I have to go to the you know go to to the client but in general I can work from wherever I am you know um so that was that was definitely one big reason because it would give me that flexibility to you know this and I'm sure you you're familiar with this as well is that you don't want to use all your holidays going home you know you want to like when you're at home like with you know in your home country yes you spend time with people but you don't you can actually be working while you're there you know you meet them in the evenings and the weekends and then you still want to have a holiday <laughs> and so that kind of, that was one thing but also um while I was in Georgia we had a few problems with the office and um the premises so I spent a lot of time working from home and I realized as well that I like to get up in the morning you know at seven o'clock uh, maybe your whatever time I decided to get up, honestly, and just start working. And then, uh, you know, maybe an hour or two later, have breakfast and an hour or two later, have a shower. And then, you know, by lunchtime, I'm dressed, you know, instead of like um, doing, you know, using my breaks to to get into the day. But, you know, getting uh, while getting the work done. And I like that kind of uh structure but of course I, I sometimes you can you get cut out because uh, in, in Rwanda things can be quite last minute so when I was living there people would call me and say is there any chance you could come into the office now <laughs> so I would say um could you give me an hour <laughs> and then jump in the shower you know so um yeah so they they were the they were some of the reasons but another big big reason was I wanted to learn and I found that like when I was working in Ireland I traveled a lot so you know you would have customers in different parts of Europe and you know suppliers and you would go and check out different markets so you learned a lot that way but when you're I found that when you're in jobs in international development you're generally based in the country um, that you're in which is nice because you don't have to be traveling all the time but the 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 opportunity for learning was limited and I also found that there was an awful lot of, or there was, there were, no, sorry, that's a bit over the top, but there were many projects which were running in parallel and there wasn't a good exchange. Whereas I felt as a freelance consultant, there was more opportunity to learn and there was more opportunity to forge links between them, different projects that were going on. And that was really nice because I was able to talk about everything and not be have to just represent one organization you know the need the interest of one organization i could really concentrate and um, obviously working for the client but then like as a consultant or someone based in rwanda other consultants would often ask you know interview me for information and that i found that i could be very useful as an independent person as well you know and then i got the opportunity to work in the in DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, I, you know, in, um, I was in Myanmar, as I mentioned, I was in Kyrgyzstan, Madagascar, um, I've done some, I haven't traveled, but I've done work in the Middle East for, um, Jordan and Yemen, and yeah, so it's been, like, in Palestine as well, so there's been a lot of opportunity to learn because of those small projects, you know? That is, uh, that's amazing, actually, to hear uh, the entire journey and essentially also give a hint on how does your day look like. Uh, so I want to spend some time there, um, especially trying to understand what kind of challenges you face in your day-to-day -day work. And if you are okay to share um, a view of that for our listeners. like freelancing is nice for people who find themselves working very hard um I suppose I started working you know when I was a barely a teenager earning you know by the hour and then when I went into a job I realized oh my goodness you 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 work <laughs> long hours and you still get paid the same you know and uh, working as a freelancer, you get paid for what you do, which is nice. Obviously, you don't get paid for all the administration and the following up on things. And there's the risk for the times you're, and you're not paid for the times that you don't have work. But at least when you do work really hard, you get paid more, which is nice. Um, 
but you have to be that person that is motivated and gets up in the morning and says, okay, this is what I'm going to do, you know? Um, I think that um, now uh, the last few months have been interesting because I have a small child and um, when they closed the, the, um, the childcare, uh, that was very interesting but because my husband is working in uh, in retail so he's he was working in in logistics so he's in uh, uh, what they call system relevant here so then I was at home <laughs> with a child trying to work so um that was very challenging and that it completely changed the whole uh, you know working from home uh, concept for me um, the other ch- challenge of that is if you know when you're in a family, if you're the one working from home, you tend to take more of the burden of the duties of the home as well, like organizing the things, being there to accept the deliveries, you know these things. So they they can eat into your time a bit. Um, however, you have the advantage of being able to do those things, which if both of us were in the office or, you know, gone out to work every day, then that's an extra nightmare that people have, you know? So um, there are those things. In terms of a typical day, I mean, at the moment, days are more typical because I can't travel. But, I mean, there's different types of days. There's days when you're really busy and, you know, you get up, you work like a machine, you have everything on some sort of a routine and you have your meetings planned, you have, you know, time set to work on different things. Um, But... um, when you're traveling then of course you know that's all gone and you just you're on the road and meeting you know like typically i would go to the field for 10 say 10 days so one weekend and you know from monday to friday the next week and then you would be the plan would be full of meetings and then you do your bits of work in the evening and on the weekend um, and even even the evenings could be uh, filled with meetings as well. So um, that's a whole different uh, type of type of day. And then, of course, there's the quiet times and then you try to um, catch up and um, catch up on things and, um, you know, get some other personal things done or take some time off, you know. Hmm. I think it's a good segue for me to talk about the elephant in all our lives these days, Mm COVID-19. And I wanted to see if uh, and how it has affected your work um, being a freelancer and being in the domain of international development. Yeah, I mean, it's it's completely um, changed international development. I was lucky because at the time when the pandemic um, was announced I was um, already negotiating to do uh, to work on a project with the team in Yemen and the reason I couldn't travel was actually for security reasons not for not because of the pandemic and you know it was agreed to to continue so I had that nice piece of work and then also there was an there's another project from which I'm still working on with Rwanda where they had wanted me to go to Rwanda originally, um, but I had all, and they said, oh, there might be a problem with the pandemic. And I actually said, actually, I know all the people you want to talk me to talk to. So there's no need for me to get on an airplane, you know, because we get the conversations remotely, which we are doing. Um, and then um, there was, there's another project in, that's well, it's still in the pipeline, in the pipeline for quite a while. And that was never, that was always going to be death work. So I, I've been lucky from that point of view but then I had another big project on and that got um stopped um and I see with other colleagues and also there's no there's no other normally other projects will be coming in where you're required to go and do an analysis or things like that and they're not there so there's you know there's not likely to be any travel till the end of the year um and I have another colleague who travels a lot and he's not traveling at all at the moment you know so um like yeah incomes are definitely down um and then um but and I, but the other side of it is not just the fact that there's less work but there are sort of three aspects there's the fact that there's less work there's also um the fact that you're doing the work but not sure like you're planning you're helping to plan for something 
but you're not sure how that will be implemented in the future given what's going on at the moment. So, for example, with Yemen, we were talking about healthcare initiatives. But now in in Yemen, the, you know, um, the pandemic or the virus is spreading rapidly. So in like, you know, we're talking about something that will be implemented uh, next year. So like, we don't know how this, what's the base point going to look like next year? What, what are the needs will have changed a lot because of the pandemic? And the pandemic, you know, for us in, you know, comfortable countries like Germany and, um, you know, the Western world. I mean, even if you look at America, where it's, it's awful, um, the implications um, they will have severe economic implications and they will have, you know, obviously the health implications and the lives that are lost are, are, are an absolute tragedy. But in the developing world, you know, you're looking at issues of access to food and food security issues because people couldn't um, uh, work properly. And, you know, you have dangers of famine and things like that if it's if it spreads more rapidly in, in Africa. So and indeed other countries. So um, I think it's something that uh, we really don't know what uh, the future is going to look like. Um, and then, yeah, and that leads me to the third aspect, like what will our work look like as consultants? What will our work look like in the future? Like I could see that actually we'll be asked more to be um, developing proposals for funding because funding will be made available for for um, uh, coping with this crisis or that, um, and I can see a lot of funding changing, you know, so maybe some things I've worked on won't actually go ahead because, you know, because they'll say, no, um, this isn't the greatest need at the moment. There's a greater need here. We need to make sure that... Um, food gets to this area you know right so these are the so yeah so it's it's a very uh uh it's a bit of an a, an unknown world at the moment to us for us at the moment right I, I, and again um appreciate how you navigated uh your response to this question from mine i think uh i i think this is a big unknown for a lot of us and especially the line of work that you are in yeah. I can't imagine how much of uh, uh, confusion and chaos it causes. So um, um, I am quite in awe how you have been able to manage uh, your your own self. And I think you mentioned that you're also a mother. Yeah. So how much of that is uh, something that you're able to manage with your day-to-day work at home, being in the pandemic at the moment? Well... To be honest, I didn't have, I don't have to travel, so I can deal, you know, that's that's a big thing. I mean, if I have to travel, the last time I did travel, my parents flew over to to help out here. So, and they wouldn't it, it'd be a nightmare if I had to travel now because my parents can't fly out here, you know. And so, you know, these are the things that uh, you know, it, everything, the whole system adjusts itself. And I mean, I work in international development, so we're used to chaos and things changing all the time. So, you know, it's not, uh, um, yeah, it's just a big adjustment. And I mean, I think as well, like in a time like this, everybody gets a lot of perspective, you know. So you say, okay, well, I'm healthy, I'm well, and you know, you don't need to earn a lot of income when you can't do much or travel so you know it's it's you know you get by the, and i mean the government have have programs in place to help out and things like that so i feel very lucky to be um where i am to be honest and yeah it's you know you somehow you just you just manage you know and we got lucky as well because but also like I, I talked about um my child being at home but that was just for five weeks because and um, we then qualified for um uh, childcare um in the second round of um so it wasn't so bad. I mean people in where I'm from in Ireland and um, people children were at home for three months, <laughs> you know, and they're out of school for six. So 
um, yeah, but they're at home. The crash is just opened, you know. Yeah, and I think when you look at all that, you you just as you said, you gain perspective. Yeah, and you get humble. Yeah, as well. exactly. All right. So, Maureen, uh, what skills one needs, uh, especially like you, in order to the, do the job that you do? Um, when I went to when I left for Rwanda in 2011. My aunt, who had gone as a missionary in the early 80s to Cameroon, she, she said to me, you need three things in Africa. She said, you need patience, a sense of humor, and money. <laughs> <laughs> but, and it was great advice. <laughs> um, the, I mean, money you can earn, but um, you need... You just need a patient when when it's say patience. I mean, you just have to expect that everything is going to go wrong. You know, um, I was, yeah, I you know, and I I, I was in a situ a personal situation last year with somebody, and I remember telling another friend of mine, who you know who also works in international development, and I was saying, you know, I think that other person. Um, finds it difficult to cope when things don't go according to plan, you know? <laughs> we just started to laugh because we would be shocked if things did go to, according to plan, you know? So you have to have that kind of, um, that flexibility to deal with that and you just have to have a kind of a learn to accept, um, you know, learn to accept that. You need, obviously, an, an intercultural skills, but intercultural skills will come as long as you have an interest and a passion for it. You know, if you're interested in being open and you just have to be open to uh, to other cultures and open to it. And then, really, it's hard work and it's it can be very thankless work. Um, it's very interesting work, but it can be very thankless. So I think it, it has to be something you really want to do and you're really interested in doing because you're never going to save the world. You can try and change something and you can try, but let's face it, politics gets the better of everything, you know? Um, but to do it, I think, yeah, you, you, you have to be passionate about it. You have to be interested in it and you have to be open to new cultures and, and just a kind of a realistic and flexible person, I think, you know? All right. Thank you, uh, Maureen, for actually sharing that. So, Maureen, I think every profession and job that we know has its own stereotypes, uh, especially perceptions, which are sometimes not right, uh, but sometimes have some sense of truth, but it's not that visible and it's not that known. So from your view and your vantage point, what are the perceptions that other people have about your work and how, what we call as stereotypes? Well, I mean, it's, it's, um, it depends on who, you know? So like if you see, uh, you know, people, you come in as the consultant on a topic in international development and the local people see, you know, will, will think you're rich and that you make lots of money. Um, the, People who don't work in the field maybe um, they see it as very exotic kind of a lifestyle, you know, she, oh, she's in Asia this week and in Africa next week. And, you know, um, that's one of the, you know, uh, um, ideas people get. Um, people in international development maybe are, they would often say, oh, consultants are people who are looking for a job, you know. So that I don't have a job, so I'll be a consultant, <laughs> so, which um, is not is true in some cases, but it's not true in many cases. And then in international development, uh, old white men would be a stereotype as well. There'd be a lot of uh, a lot of um, you know re uh, retired um, you know men who've worked in development, and then um yeah like i would say the average age of people working in consulting would be uh, is well over 60 you know um or no so not well over 60 but maybe 60 you know there's not that many like i'm 41 and there wouldn't be that many of this age group you know um yeah okay 
And I think we are almost about at the end of our conversation. It, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm just beating myself. I would, I would love to spend more time just going over the experiences that you have and what it taught you. I think we should probably, if you are interested, park it for a further conversation, if you have time for that little time. Yeah, sure. So, uh, Maureen, we just want to end with the part about, uh, especially for people who are listening to this podcast and they want to get into this profession, right? So if they are interested from the stories that you share today, where should they start and what experiences you recommend them to have? Well, actually, um, so there is a lady called Maya Gede. And Maya, um, she fell into development like some people do. And she found, though, that there was no, like, she was fascinated by how people, you know, came into this area of work. And she, but she, she realized that there is no, there was no literature out there to do this. So she, so she wrote a book about it. And, but like, it's a, it's a kind of an academic, it's a, it's a career guide to working in humanitarian development and international, no, it's called International and Development and Humanitarian Assistance, a career guide. And she wrote that, I think she wrote that around 2011, 2012. Um, and she interviewed lo lots of people. She did a lot of research and interviews. She, I was one of the interviewees. But um, she, um, that's one of the few books out there that will really say, okay, these are the steps and this is how you will go about it. These are the organizations you could work for. These are the fields you could study and um, all of that kind of thing. Yeah, and that it's, it's quite pricey. I looked at it today, it's about 42 euro, but it, um, that's available on Amazon and paperback or hardback. Can you repeat the name of the book one more time, Maureen? Yeah, so it's um, International Development and Humanitarian Assistance, a Career Guide. And okay. it's by Maya Gede, M-A-I-A -A and G-E-D-D-E. -D -D -E. Okay, okay, that's yeah. great. Um, and then, yeah, and um, so that's, yeah, because otherwise there's not really, I mean, what people could do is, I mean, what I did actually was I took a course in, uh, a night course in human rights and then decided to go on and do a master's in international development in order to... Um, into to help me break into the field and understand the field um you know but so but also by doing things like that you can get into these networks of people that work in this field and talking to people who work in the field i think is a good way because um it's not actually that big of a circle a lot of people know each other um but that's a good way to get an insight um, if you're more interested, though, just in, um, in, in the humanitarian side or just in, in volunteering for a bit or escaping from, uh, you know, life as you know it. Um, and someone else I know wrote a, um, a book, The Underground Guide to International Volunteering. And it's about her experiences going on these, you know, uh, different, uh, well, I think these different um um volunteer stints for a couple of months and she was able to say you know which organizations were good to work for and if you want to do this then you're more suited to to that and this is what this is like and she did a lot of work um building mud houses um so her name is kirsty henderson and her book was called the underground guide to international volunteering and it's a kindle book you know so that might you know it's that's and it's a it's a, it's like a little reference book um which is not so ideal for kindle but um it's a nice little read um you know to get some insight into what that kind of work is like all right i i would really look for the links and put it up in the show notes um yeah as I can, soon this podcast is up yeah Fantastic. Thank you, Maureen. I think the conversation was so fascinating and stimulating for me. And I hope uh, when this podcast is out, uh, listeners would deeply enjoy uh, this conversation. Uh, for people who are listening and would like to reach out to you in case they have questions, yeah. uh, what would be the right channel and the medium to get to you? Um, through LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah. 
So are you okay if I could add the link in, uh, link to the show notes as well? Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen. I am so humbled that you chose uh, to invest your one hour with me today and get into this conversation. Thanks, Vivek. I hope uh, sometime I can, we can exchange more on the intercultural experiences. It's always fascinating. Oh, but absolutely. It's, it's always lovely to, to talk about it and to share, and it helps me to reflect as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, if you are up to it and you have time and opportunity within your schedule, I think that that that's could become another big episode just to share our stories of going through different cultures and learnings that we have. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you for joining this podcast. I hope this was useful and you learned a lot. For more such great podcasts, please do not forget to subscribe to the podcast channel In Your Shoes on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Music. New podcasts uploaded every two weeks. Goodbye.